Uh, I should also mention that these subnets, uh, they're not a free for all. It's not like uh, layer two, everybody does something, you know, according to whatever they like, and they don't, there's no cohesive uh, thing around them. Uh, these subnets can send messages from one to the other using warp messaging. So Avalanche warp messaging or warp for short allows me to send you a message. I can in fact teleport my uh, assets from my chain to you. So if I'm in the US and you're in uh, Australia, I can just be like, okay, well, you know, here's an asset transfer or here's a service request from my chain to yours. So um, this makes us quite different. We can scale without a, an upper number, right? So a single chain will always have some finite, finite number, finite number of transactions. Well, I can always create another chain and add some more capacity to my system. So Avalanche can do this. These uh, multi-chain systems can do it. There are only a few of us, but none of the single chain systems can do this. And that's a huge step up. Um, I've been saying this for years. I've been saying this for four or five years, maybe four years at least. Uh, no, five years, just since 2018. And uh, the thesis hasn't changed. GM, so just a quick one before we get started. So Still Early is a podcast for educational and informational purposes only and should not be considered as financial advice. Any investment decision you should make should be based on your own research and your own understanding of the risks involved. So yeah, that's it for me. Let's get on with the show. All right, welcome back to another episode of Still Early. Thanks so much for everyone, all the kind words and all the support. This this channel has actually grown quicker than the Blockmates channel, <laughs> which is bittersweet, but great. And whoever's been following us quiet for the past eight weeks now, you'll have noticed that we've been covering the Avalanche ecosystem in detail. And if you have been following along, this next guest will need no introduction. Emin, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I can imagine how busy you are at the minute. So um, thanks for taking the time out. and. Uh, Look forward to chatting today. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So been following you personally, and obviously the ecosystem developed from, from the early days. Um, I've always wanted to ask, how does one in yourself go from pre kind of Bitcoin early days, you get your doctorate in computer science, and then could you have ever envisaged you'd be doing what you are now if, when you went on that initial path at university? Mm -hmm. No, it blows my mind. I had no <laughs> idea at the time. I was I was pretty dead set on becoming an academic, and uh, this was uh, maybe twenty three years ago. And uh, I was a young young assistant professor. Um, I had this huge interest in self organizing systems, and all I wanted to do was build really large scale systems that stood up on their own, that wouldn't crash, that you know lived by uh, lived by some kind of a promise that they gave to their users. And uh, we didn't really know how to do them at the time, right? It was, it was like the days of Kazaa, the days of, of file sharing Napster. You know, we were just beginning to build peer-to-peer -peer systems and I had no idea I would end up where I am today. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Because a lot of people go into like university, like a very well-trodden path. And like, I, I know doctors, like lawyers, and they know what's at the end of it. It's a, it's a very well-trodden path and there's a, like, a definitive outcome. But the industry where it is now, there's no way you could have pictured that. Like, does that kind of baffle your brain at times? Absolutely no way. So, you know, just to give you an uh, idea of, of uh, what we dealt with or what we are dealing with, we were learning about zero knowledge proofs at some point, right? In the 90s, I was a graduate student and uh, I was learning about this technology. And lo and behold, uh, you know, 18, 19 years later, um, Zcash comes along and people are paying, you know, upwards of, uh, I think, on the day it came out, um, Zcash traded at about $3 million a coin. So somebody's paying $3 million for a zero knowledge proof. So <laughs> that's, that's totally nuts, right? Uh, and uh, so we had no idea that this technology would take off the way it did. No, nobody did. Anyone who says they, they knew it all along, they knew sound money was going to go do this, that, and the other. No, you did not. No one did. Early days of Bitcoiners, you know, I was I was so happy. Oh, I'll give you some examples. I was so happy when Bitcoin was 10. When it reached $10, it was amazing. Um, I remember when it reached $60 and it was holding 60. I was like, whoa, this is this is a thing. Uh, at around, I think at around five or so, if I'm not mistaken, when Bitcoin was $5, 
I had a chat with uh, with the dean of um, uh, of, of of the computer science, computer computing and information science at Cornell University, and I said to her, you know, ha ha ha, you have a budget of uh, you know, I think her budget is about five million dollars. You know, wouldn't it be funny if you were to buy buy Bitcoin with all of that? And it was a joke, and everyone you know around the lunch table was like, yeah, ha ha, whatever. And then, sure enough, a few years later, it reaches the heights it did, and everyone's looking around the, <laughs> the lunch table, kind of uncomfortably <laughs> thinking hey, we could buy, could start to buy some other universities with this. And uh, and now at uh, forty-two thousand, of course, that sounds, uh, you know, it sounds prescient. Uh, so yeah, no one, no one had any idea we'd come to where we are. Yeah, I think you could have bought some small countries off the back of that. Absolutely. <laughs> a couple of islands for Nell to expand into. Absolutely. <laughs> and there was there was some work you were doing like pre white paper and, and stuff like that. I'd I'd love to just kind of hear just some kind of tales from, from that era because for me coming in not technical whatsoever, um, I was supposed to go down the cancer research scientist route got dragged into this industry and like never looked back but i'd, I'd love to hear like the, some of the some of the stories from that those times sure um around 2001 is when this whole peer-to-peer -peer revolution was happening and uh and my main interest at the time i was an operating systems person uh with a huge interest in distributed systems you can't build an operating system you know the opportunity is there only only every decade or so so i'm in between projects so to speak and, uh, and I was looking into distributed systems, I was looking into Napster, um, and uh, all these file sharing networks suffered from a very common problem, which is everybody wants to take resources, nobody wants to contribute resources, right? This is age old tragedy of the commons, nobody wants to do a good thing, everybody wants to benefit off the work of others, right? So, um, uh, and so, and this is early days, so BitTorrent hadn't been invented yet. And uh, at about the same time, uh, the BitTorrent folks were coming up with that design of tit for tat, you know, I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a block and you'll give me a block, right? And so that's just barter economy. And I, I looked into that and I was like, look, this is not the world's best idea. Uh, I can only barter with you if we have a commonality of interests, right? Um, and I have something to offer. When I start out, I've got nothing. The very first block is really hard to acquire. I have to beg for it and rely on the kindness of strangers. So I was like, no, we need something better than this. What's better than barter? Well, a, a monetary system is obviously better than barter. We, we know this. People teach this to you in school. And so uh, it can't be a monetary scheme where someone's in control because obviously uh, it doesn't fit the whole application use case. So why don't we invent a monetary system where there is no central bank? And uh, when you want to download a block, well, then you have to pay for it. And, uh, and if, if a block is really rare in the system, you're, you're uploading a file that very few other people have, you can charge more for it. And, um, and, and, and if you are uh, uh, downloading something, you pay for it. And if you only take things, at some point you'll run out of your purse, you'll run out of your cash or coins, and you will have to be a good person again, you'll have to put up resources. That was the genesis of this idea called Karma. Me and uh, two or three uh, master students uh, worked on this project. Actually, no, that's not right. Um, two master's students and a PhD student. Uh, we worked on this project in 2002. It was published in 2003. And the way we got rid of uh, the central bank was uh, <laughs> to come up with something called proof of work minting. So, uh, so exactly what Bitcoin does is exactly what we did in uh, the Karma system. And it was published uh, five, six years, six years before, before Bitcoin. So uh, that was fun. Um, now, let me be clear. We did not have the entirety of Bitcoin in there. Satoshi had a brilliant next step idea, which was he took the consensus part, he took the transaction serialization part and folded that into the minting of coins. So he created the blockchain. We didn't really have a blockchain. We had coin balances and bank sets. So it was a little bit of a different system. It, it, it merged classical consensus with this new minting mechanism, but it's a half step towards uh, where we got to with Bitcoin. It's a very well-cited system. Academics know about it. It's, uh, it's well known. And uh, but I didn't have also, I did not have the vision that Satoshi had. Satoshi came after the 2008 crash and he was trying to come up with a new monetary system. I had a far more realizable, um, realizable goal of a vision that was just simply, let's make uh, file sharing systems on the internet work with, a, with magic internet currency where no one's in charge. 
And then I'll tell you what's happened afterwards. I think that's the more interesting part. So I published this work. I'm really excited about peer-to-peer. -peer. And I talked to my mentors, the, sort of the older professors at Cornell. And on equivocally, they said, look, you should not be working on this. There is no way that you will get a dime of funding for this kind of work. Read the room. Everybody is worried about post 9-11 financing. Everybody is worried about terrorist financing. If you did the opposite of this work, then maybe you'd get funding. But, uh, but if you do this, you can't make it happen. And so one of the other ideas that Satoshi had was to, to make himself anonymous, to disappear, and, uh, and to do it as, a, as an unknown. And that was actually a brilliant idea as well. So, uh, so anyway, so Karma was very early. I learned a lot through it. And it's, uh, it's an early, well-cited system among academics. Uh, and, uh, and so it is where it is. It, it formed a critical part of sort of the background thinking for what came later. Incredible, absolutely incredible, and the whole the, the Satoshi being being anonymous. I, I still think to this day is one of the most kind of. It's more. It should be for kind of like a Turner Prize, more of like an artistic, poetic, like it, absolutely incredible. It blows my mind to this day. And like yeah. people come into the industry, I, I, first thing I point them to is that, and then you can kind of see it click, and that's like that's it. Them down the rabbit hole for the rest of the mm -hmm. rest of their entirety. I want to bring it up to a little bit more modern day. Um, what, what's it been like the past 18 months? Like a bit of a harsh crypto winter, a lot of fallout from the very entities that we're trying to move away from. So what, what's it been like for you personally and, and Everlabs? Um, so let's see. Uh, in general, the bear markets are a, are a great time. So between the two of us and your audience, I have to say I actually like bear markets. I love building in them. Avalanche was born in a bear market. And... Um, some of the frustrations in a bull market just don't exist. So all of those people that you knew were not going to be around. They had no staying power. They had no intent to stay around. They had no ability to see their ideas through to completion. But they make a lot of a lot of noise during the bull market, right? But then they they disappear in the bear. So that's great to see. So first of all, you get a cleansing, so to speak, a ritual uh, absolution uh, of uh, of a certain kind. You know, all these people disappear. Yeah, it's really good. Um, so we have a clearer, clearer path ahead and, uh, and less noise on the system. Uh, it's a good time to build. That's good. Um, the blowback onto the crypto space is real, right? So, uh, so a lot of uh, institutions that, that we were talking to, that I was talking to, uh, you know, when FTX collapsed, they took a step back. There was a, there was a definite chill in the room when that happened. And, um, uh, but on the plus side, Every single person, thanks to the last cycle, um, every single person at any large asset management firm knows about crypto. In the old days, I would say four years ago, five years ago, I would still have to explain what crypto is. I would still have to explain to them the value proposition. And even those who had heard of it, they didn't really understand it because they hadn't really touched it, right? That familiarity wasn't there. It's like, I can explain the internet to you, Right. And you'll maybe get it if you haven't used it before. But once you use it, it's a different game. This is similar for crypto. So in this cycle, in this bear market, everyone I talk to, everyone understands what a digital asset is. They understand the value proposition. They're like, yeah, we, we, we can do that. Right. So here are the limitations. Here are the reasons why we can't do it just yet. But and we understand that custody is a problem. Compliance is a problem, etc. So so it's a it's a different ball game now. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's good. It's uh, in general, uh, I think where we are is fine. And if this is the depths of the bear market, if this is what we're dealing with, I'll take it. This is not so bad after all. Bitcoin at 41K, uh, a lot of people who understand the, 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 the space and, uh, and in fact, uh, a lot of uh, interest in the space is fantastic. Uh, and uh, and I, I'm really, really excited for what's to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. It feels like a definite, definite turn of the tide of a, over recent months, but uh, it was it was strange. Even even a couple of the conferences we, I was attending last year, it just felt like even though we were in that quite brutal and ha harsh crypto winter, there was just so much optimism around. Because I'd yeah. say last cycle, we really started to kind of show what could be possible, and like yeah. there was working products that you could see could display some kind of incumbent kind of institutions and things like that and that was really impressive and there was if you'd have dropped me there and said what is happening in the market i'd have said we're in a roaring bull market but it wasn't it was just pretty pretty bad markets downturn but everyone just felt a little bit more optimistic you know and 
th those people that you say kind of where you initially were telling them about it, do you think that cohort of people get it now? Do you think do you think everyone's like, yeah, this this thing's here, this there, and it actually is better, faster, cheaper? Like, and that's that's how like technology advances. Yeah, I'm not going to say that everyone on Earth gets it, right? So uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I would also say that DeFi is still very hard to access for most people. So um, that hasn't happened yet. I think we need uh, we need another sort of a good few years uh, for people to really come up with the user interfaces that put coins second and the experience first. So that's that's going to take a bit more time. Uh, we need to onboard a lot of another billion people to DeFi. And we haven't br br uh, broached the first billion mark yet. In fact, I don't know if, if we broached the first hundred million. So um, we need far more users. We need to bring on far more people. But, uh, but certainly people who are asset managers, people who are in finance, uh, they get it. So, and, and that's a really, really good thing to see because now we can have real world assets come in. One of the big problems in this space is that it's so reflexive. It's so inward oriented and, and coin values and, and, uh, and, and sort of coin functionality is dependent on very complex inward oriented chains. So that when you have a, a, a sort of a disturbance on one side of the spectrum, it affects a crap load of other things as well. And, uh, and so I would like to see that, that get uh, a little bit more dampened down. I'd like to see proper assets you know, with real world backing in this new system that would form the foundation of collateral that doesn't, you know, devastatingly change in value overnight. That will that will bring a lot of good things to to to, to us. Um, and one other thing I would like to see, and this is something that the bear market brings by, is uh, this crazy expectation that got that got built up in the last cycle in the last bull market. This crazy expectation of overnight enormous profits, uh, it should dissipate <laughs> away, right? There is, there is no way you can legitimately triple your money in like, you know, in, 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 in a month. It's just not going to happen. But there are a bunch of people out there who had that expectation last time. They were looking at, you know, things we were doing on top of Avalanche. Uh, we brought the KKR fund, for example. It's the healthcare fund from KKR. KKR, for people who don't know, is the world's biggest asset manager. And um, uh, they create these funds. They're incredibly, incredibly selective. Like you and I cannot buy those, buy into those funds. And uh, they have great returns on the order of, you know, 30 percent a year, right? Because they invest in businesses, etc. And so the KKR fund that we brought in, when you tell people it's like 30 percent annual return, a lot of these crypto DJs are like, well, you know, I can triple my money on uh, <laughs> on uh, on Terra Luna. Well, <laughs> you know, see how long that lasts. <laughs> yeah, that's not really going to last that long. That long. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, it's, uh, it's it's I think that expectation that we have to break. I think as we bring in more people with with more down to earth, realistic expectations, it's going to be a different universe. Absolutely. So. I really want to get into this next topic and it feels like every other day there's um, some financial institution, a product, an app or a game launching their own subnet. And it, it was always coming. And But now it, I, I, I feel like I'm really starting to see it pick up. And we've been interviewing a couple of the games here releasing the subnets. But for people who maybe are watching this coming in a little bit cold, can you kind of give a, a bit of a primer on subnets and maybe like, how they differ from from other kind of network architecture that's on the market? Sure, um, and it's it's very simple, uh, really, to explain what happened here. So, if I look back at the last 11, 12 years of of this crypto space's evolution, I see a very distinct trend. We first had the original chain of them all, right? Bitcoin, which we all love, and uh, Bitcoin is a at least until recently, until the ordinals came along, uh, Bitcoin is a single asset, single chain system. You've got BTC, the asset, that's that's all it was designed to really uphold. Everything else is sort of glommed on and the Bitcoin core developers don't necessarily like everything else. They, they love the asset and, uh, and don't really support anything else. Uh, so Bitcoin, BTC is the asset and, uh, and you've got the single chain that upholds it. Uh, following that came Ethereum and smart contracts, which brought us the ability to program the chain and so using that program programmability, you can create your own assets. So Ethereum today is a multi-asset system, but it's still a single chain. Okay. So when you have a single chain, you only have one set of rules, one set of, uh, one set of nodes for the entire world, for all use cases. 
Avalanche is one of a very small number of uh, projects. There's Avalanche, there's Cosmos, there's Polkadot. These three projects are the latest, latest uh, in this evolution game where we are multi-asset. You can have as many assets as you like. You can have as many programmable smart contract bearing chains as you like on, on Avalanche with multi-chain. So you can create your own assets and you can also create your own chains and your own node networks for your own use. Do you want to build a game? You can do it. You want to build a chain that's super fast where all the validators have to be really big, beefy nodes because you're going to run it hot. You're going to run it at the, at the extreme end of what the hardware is capable of. Sure, you can do it. You can create your own chain for that. Do you have a bunch of assets that, uh, are only, that should only be available to the US uh, where the validators can do all sorts of things that are US specific? Sure, we can do that. Do you have some data that has GDPR requirements? We can do that. Do you have some data that needs to never leave a certain, never leave a certain jurisdiction? We can do that. Whatever your requirements can be, we can create a chain for, for people to, uh, to implement it. And with Hyper SDK, Hyper VM, you can actually have your own virtual machine. You're not even confined to a specific virtual machine. Avalanche today supports not only the Ethereum virtual machine, but also the Move virtual machine, and it can support it can support Wasm, it can support uh, any other virtual machine that anybody wants to wants to put on it. So that's really the big change with with the subnet architecture. Uh, I should also mention that these subnets uh, they're not a free for all. It's not like uh, layer two. Everybody does something you know according to whatever they like, and they, there's no cohesive uh, thing around them. Uh, these subnets can send messages from one to the other using warp messaging. So Avalanche warp messaging or warp for short allows me to send you a message. I can in fact teleport my uh, assets from my chain to you. So if I'm in the US and you're in uh, Australia, I can just be like, okay, well, you know, here's an asset transfer or here's a service request from my chain to yours. So um, this makes us quite different. We can scale without a, an upper number, right? So a single chain will always have some finite, finite number, finite number of transactions. Well, I can always create another chain and add some more capacity to my system. So Avalanche can do this. These uh, multi-chain systems can do it. There are only a few of us, but none of the single chain systems can do this. And that's a huge step up. Um, I've been saying this for years. I've been saying this for four or five years, maybe four years at least. Oh, no, five years, just since 2018. And uh, the thesis hasn't changed. So at a higher level and notch up, if you look at all these single chain systems, they all are scratching their heads constantly. They're like, okay, how do we scale? What do we do? Do we use verifiable delay functions, verifiable random functions? Do we use accumulators? Do we use plasma chains? Do we use some other layer two technology? And it gets really, really complicated. Uh, you know, do we use protodank sharding? Do we use some other, you know, gobbledygook terms that have been invented to describe this really complex space? And they have to, they have to constantly be conjuring up these ideas to scale because you know, the chain only has so much capacity. They need, they need that extra edge for the extra use case. So we have been resolute in how we see the world. And the thesis that we had, the central thesis has been remarkably stable. We never went down any of these blind alleys. All of those things that I mentioned, maybe except uh, the latest ones, right? Um, all of them have been tried and failed, tried and failed. Where are the plasma chains now? Where are the VRFs? Where are the VDFs? Where are the RCAs? I don't see them anywhere. So there were a whole bunch of blind alleys that the entire community went into. And I can tell you as an expert in this area that I could tell that that was going to happen for each and every case. And, and I can tell you today, as I've said it you know, for the last five years, the subnet architecture is the only one that will have that staying power because it's the most basic, it's the most elemental form of scaling. It allows you to create another chain according to your own rules. So anyways, so that's my little... A uh, short summary of uh, of uh, what I think is uh, is different about us, not only at the sort of concrete, here's what we do differently level, but also philosophically, we come at it with the best of science, with the best of of uh, you know of research from the academic side, and we bring it applied in a very pragmatic way to the blockchain problem, and that's why we've been able to build these systems that have had the enduring power that they've had. That was a, a great answer. <laughs> no, you, you, I'm, just, I'm just slowly sipping my coffee. I'll get more and more worked up as we go along. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, what's uh, what's been interesting? Some of the guests that we've had on over the past couple of weeks, and and you mentioned UI UX. What I what I think a lot of DeFi products could learn from what I'm seeing on the gaming side is those guys have have really nailed down their UI UX, and it feels like it's a game, and then a lot of the stuff is happening on crypto rails behind it. But it's a game first, and and I think where we went wrong the first iteration of when we started to see games was it was crypto first, but and it was kind of a game, but it kind of wasn't. Yeah. But they all have account abstracted wallets, seamless onboarding, basically gasless transactions. The user doesn't necessarily know that they're using all this infrastructure on the back end. And I do think that gaming may, may push us, one, to get us those extreme large amounts of people that come in because the, the gaming community is absolutely huge worldwide. Um, and I also think they're leading the way in UI UX because I don't think the average gaming user or like the, or the gaming community are going to kind of put up with some of the kind of pitfalls of what we're putting up with in what we're seeing in DeFi. Well, you don't but think you don't, of... you don't think they're going to write down 24 words before they start the game? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. No, they want to so play the game right. and they, and they want proof of ownership. Yeah. Yeah, no, you are so right. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I love the gaming area uh, because it's so demanding, right? It's demanding from a from a you know, system system architect point of view. You know, you, you got to have high TPS. Uh, you got to be able to deal with congestion. We got to deal with load load peaks and so on. But also on the user experience side, it has to be seamless. It has to look and feel like a game. And uh, Grant, I played this game um, called Godzilla. And I played it for only 20 minutes. I don't know if you know about this one. I don't know if you, if people have watched the trailers that are online. I'd watch the trailers. The trailers are really cool. But then I played it for 20 minutes. And you know how I have in my mind, like everybody has in their mind, like the maps of different cities. I have a map of New York. I have a map of San Francisco. You know, everywhere I've lived in, map of Seattle. I have an idea of these different cities. Now I have a map of that city. And I have dreams where I go back there. It's so addictive. And it's, it can't be addictive if you're typing hexadecimal numbers, if you are like ledger approving transactions, it has to be so seamless. Like in that game, you kill someone and you take their like mechanical arm, rip it off and uh, throw out your arm and stick that in. And now you have a different mechanical arm. It's just an amazing thing. That was an NFT transaction, right? You just took an NFT and stuck it on your left arm. So they did this. They did such a nice job of this. And uh, that's the kind of thing that we need to take this to the next set of users. I'm so excited about Godzilla. Shrapnel's out. That's also a very nice game. Uh, I played that one as well. It's uh, it's sort of a first-person shooter. I got I got my butt handed handed to me by a bunch of other people <laughs> who were playing it at the same conference. Um, I hate you all. <laughs> so I was hiding behind that truck. That goddamn it! But someone kept I don't know some people. I think they were all sort of in cahoots shooting at me. Um, so they kept, kept killing me. But it was that's also a great game. It was it was a lot of fun. So we'll see a bunch of AAA games coming in. And as you pointed out, the very first games that came in, they had that token aspect. Uh, they had that uh, the weird sort of reflexive thing going on in them, and um, you know it's it wasn't clear what, you know how that would pan out. But the gameplay was not first and foremost. These new games are game first, seamless interaction, mobile marketplaces for game objects, so you can buy and sell your mech arms and mech legs and whatnot. It's just an amazing, amazing future. I can't wait for these games to launch. A couple more are going to come soon, and so I'm really excited. Yeah, I've. We um, interviewed Theo from Godzilla and released, released that actually yesterday. And um, I've said to Dan, who's kind of our resident game nerd at, at Blockmates, I was like, if productivity drops off when um, Off the Grid comes out, I'll know why, because he keeps talking about it. He keeps talking about it. And he's been trying to like get into the, the, the shrapnel test net and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. But I, I guarantee it's gonna productivity from us is just going to fall off a cliff. When Definitely. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm about to buy a PC gaming setup solely for that game myself. And uh, it's just so awesome. And, you know, it's just like a fix. I, I got addicted in, in, in 20 minutes. So uh, it's, it's just amazing what they've done. Is there, is there anything aside from uh, gaming that you might have a unique perspective on? Because you, you'll see everything like come down the pipe in, in, in the Avalanche ecosystem. Is there anything that's like maybe a little bit left field that people might not be aware of? Like, like has, has really piqued your interest and, you know, just kind of give us a bit of insight on anything like that or even just something that you're personally interested in that you'd like to see get developed? 
Sure. Um, let's see. So I'm not going to bore you with the new DeFi projects that are coming online. That's sort of, you know, cool stuff. I, I really love that stuff. And that's really great. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with uh, moon math, uh, zero knowledge, uh, sort of privacy solutions. Uh, they're coming. And I'm not going to go into uh, institutional. I can do that. I'm super excited about institutional use of blockchains. That's, you know, one of the things I live and die for. Um, but uh, so that's happening as well. And, uh, and so we're seeing more and more signs of large institutions moving on to chains, doing things on chain with transparency, with assurance. So those are really exciting. But I can talk about, say, the arena. That caught me by surprise. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we had all these different verticals and people were like doing their usual things like, oh, what's the killer application of blockchains, you know? And uh, they're all, it's all in front of you. So uh, hang on. And now I've had enough coffee. Now I'm going to rant a little bit. <laughs> I was around in the 90s. I was around in the early 90s. I was a graduate student and all these people would come by and they'd be like, and these are like really old researchers, right? Look, oh, this internet thing, you know, it looks pretty cool, but what's the killer app? The killer app is in front of you. You've been using email the whole damn time, right? You're sending messages in a way that you could never before. That's the first killer app. There'll be many others, but that's a killer app. You don't have to look and, and get far-fetched. But the answer, the answer always, for some reason, in the early in 1992, 1993, 1994, the answer to what's the killer app for the internet was always something far-fetched and ridiculous. It was always... In fact, like 80% of the time, it was your refrigerator will tell you what to buy when you go out to shop. It's like, what the hell was that? Your refrigerator will never know what's in it. Target will know what you're missing without having to have any smarts in your refrigerator. I'm not going to scan my goods as I, you know, I'm not going to scan an egg in and out as I, you know, make my breakfast, whatever. So it's crazy stuff, right? So people are always looking for these crazy killer apps. So to your audience, I have to say this. Don't be one of these crazy people looking for some far-fetched far -fetched killer app. The killer apps are here. Tokenization is the killer app. I can make a token and I can send it around the world in a split second with Avalanche. With other chains, it's a little slower. So that's the killer app. There's so much you can do with that. that just the same way on the internet, I can send you a packet and you get the packet and then you can do, you know, you put some, you know, some information in it. Now I can trigger things around the world. So, uh, so that is the killer app itself. I don't have to find like all these fancy, you know, clever things. So that was my little rant. Um, and, uh, but going back, uh, there are these verticals and, uh, and then suddenly a new vertical emerged called social fi. And the arena is, I think, an, a great example of this. It was probably, it still is, the best example of them. And uh, what is the arena? So let me very quickly describe what it is to you. It's, it feels, looks and feels kind of like Twitter. It looks like a social application where people post things. But behind the scenes and unbeknownst to you and without really having to do anything whatsoever, there are tokens in play. So um, if there's somebody you want to follow, you have to buy one of their tokens. And uh, the, 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 the holding of the token that belongs to, say, Grant, allows me to go into his private chat area with, with other people who are token holders of Grant, and I can now ask questions to Grant. This is a pretty awesome thing to be able to do, right? There are a bunch of people out there who need to meter uh, their audience, who need to have some kind of a gating ability for their audience, and the arena gives them that. It's kind of like a social club uh, sort of permissioning uh, system, a social club uh, membership system. That's what it is. No NFTs involved. It's just a bunch of tokens that are sort of behind uh, behind the scenes. It feels natural. And um, and of course, the moment this happens, there's a speculative element that suddenly what people will do is, you know, when Grant shows up, what would I do if I'm a smart guy? I'll be like, you know, Grant's got a great following. People will want to buy his token. So why don't I buy his token and sell it to those other people who come in to talk to him? And so that creates a speculative game. It's definitely not a Ponzi because money is flowing from the older people in the system to the new people in the system. It's the exact opposite. It's like an ISNAP or something. This is the opposite of a Ponzi. So, um, and it's, it's really, really interesting that, uh, that it's structured that way. And it sort of bootstraps itself. So people are coming in, they they get some money raining down on them as soon as they show up. And, uh, and so, and then they participate in the system. It was so much fun. Um, and uh, uh, so it had uh, an unfortunate hack. In fact, it had two. 
uh, one small one and, and one uh, that was a little bit bigger that caused a little bit of a, an issue. And uh, uh, but, but the nice thing about the arena is that it transitioned to a new new team now. And uh, so I'm really excited about what they're building. I'm generally very, very bullish on social fi. There'll be many other applications like this where tokens are not first and foremost, they're behind the scenes, where tokens are not glommed on, they're not afterthoughts. Like Reddit supposedly added NFT support. I know a chain that paid enormous sums of money to, uh, to Instagram to support NFTs. Instagram supported NFTs to collect the cash and dropped support for all NFTs. Those are afterthoughts. Those are things you're adding on after the fact. They will never go anywhere. Everybody was so excited. Oh my God, Instagram and this other chain that, you know, goes backwards every day a little bit. You know, it's just, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what to say about that. We could tell that that was just an asinine play at the time. And it's just a waste of money of that and the resources of that community. So, um, so it's really these kinds of innovative applications where the tokens are behind the scenes and, uh, and sort of not for, uh, front and center and not an afterthought either. So that, that's the combination that I think is the killer combo. Yeah, there was there was a really interesting use case of that kind of keys mechanism that I've seen from actually from another uh, another team that just released their subnet, Mirai Labs, who have the Pegaxi game and the Petopia game. So what they wanted to do with it, instead of it like say me buying your keys to get access to that, it would be say you have a gaming guild that is like operating games in the Mirai ecosystem. And if you thought, well, these guys these guys know this stuff, they've they've got They've got previous. They, they. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna access their guild, so they can, you can buy access to their guild. They're gonna go and play in the Mirai, or maybe even if like further afield in the Avalanche ecosystem in the games. And if they're playing like revenue generating games or the keys, like the obviously the bonding curve as a as a slight tax, I believe in, in it, then you can just choose to distribute from the guild if there's revenue share or profit share to token holders. So even just using that, there was another idea. I can't remember who said it. Imagine. Imagine you could go see a grassroots band or you followed a grassroots band on Spotify right. and there was a way to be like, I I know these are going to be huge. Yeah. I, I know. I just know. And then there was a way to like, in a similar sort of fashion to what you would with friend tech where you could say, this account's quite up and coming or this company's quite up and coming. I want to kind of play, place my chips here because I know it's going to increase in value and the like, whole social, social dynamics of that. A million ways you could take it. Yeah. And I just think we've just hit that, like that kind of, that initial moment of where like the creative spark will just continue and, and proliferate out. So excited, excited to see how that uh, turns out. I love that idea. I love that idea. Also, I love that idea from a very different perspective. So uh, I, uh, I used to have uh, some fun with trying to identify up and coming uh, Americana bands, folksy bands. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, uh, I remember attending this concert by a tiny group in a, in a venue with like 200 people. They're called the Lumineers. Maybe some people have heard of them. <laughs> so I would have loved to <laughs> to buy some of their tokens then. So uh, so yeah, it's it's a great uh, that's a great idea. I'd love to. I'd honestly love to. I don't know how far we are away from it, but like music NFTs and NFT royalties and stuff like. I'd love to see that come to the fore because I know it's a grind if you're a musician, particularly on Spotify. Like I think it's a million views and you get around $4,000 mm -hmm. split between five people in a band and your agency and you publish it. Democratize that there's infrastructure that are going to do it like that. That'd be amazing for, mm -hmm. to see. Maybe we need to build it. <laughs> Absolutely. Somebody did. Yeah. yeah it, it's, it's coming. It's coming. And I can't wait to see it uh, on chain. So I've got two questions that I've been trying to wrap my head around. So you mentioned Avalanche Warp messaging and tel and adjacent to this, I believe, is, is Teleporter. And I was just wondering if you could kind of like enlighten me on that. Oh, sure. Um, warp messaging is uh, the mechanism that we use for, uh, for one subnet, for one chain on top of Avalanche to send a message to another. So it's the underlying building block for uh, doing things like sending an asset from, that's been created on one chain uh, to another so that it can be processed there. So what can you use this for? Um, you can use this for taking, for example, the game assets on a gaming subnet and then using them as collateral in DeFi, right? Because the DeFi, DeFi chain is somewhere else. It's not with the game. You don't want it with the game. You don't want the gaming load spikes 
to affect what happens on the DeFi chain. You don't want it to, you know, to, to impact your ability to put up, put down more collateral or take loans out, et cetera. You don't want those two things to mix with each other. You want some separation between them, but you want these chains to communicate. So warp messaging is what gives us that. Um, it's a very general mechanism. It's uh, not only for wrapping assets and, and creating wrapped assets on other chains, but it's also uh, a mechanism for sending a message that says, hey, these, these assets are here and I want you to do something else over on the other chain. So when might that be interesting? Um, I can give you an example uh, of from uh, this, uh, one of these DeFi applications that's unique to Avalanche and I believe it to be the best of its kind. Uh, and its kind is it's a, it's a central limit order book. It's a DEX. Okay? It's kind of like Trader Joe. It's kind of like Uniswap. Uh, but those are AMM based. They, they have an automated market maker. This is more like uh, your Binance, your Coinbase. There is an order book and there are people who are selling things and buying things. So what do you want to do? Well, you want assets there. You want those assets to be very secure. You want them to be to, to be on a very decentralized network. You want all of those, that goodness. Um, but you don't want your trading to happen on that main secure network. Why not? Well, because it's expensive, because it's shared between a lot of people. So you want a, a cheaper chain where you can do trades, but you want a more secure chain where you keep the assets. So that dual homed dual chain design is central to Dex a lot. That's the, the name of the project. And uh, they are they're used, they use two different uh, two different subnets, they straddle two different networks and um, and they support uh, these kinds of uh, operations where assets are on one chain and the transactions happen in the other one. And so, um, uh, so it's uh, so warp can can support things like this. I think Dexalot is not exactly using warp even as we speak, uh, but they they are very much planning to very soon. And um, uh, and so uh, so anyway, the bottom line is uh, warp allows us to have have applications like this where the chains are communicating with each other. Uh, teleporter is a usage is essentially sort of a front end top level structure that uh, hides the complexities of warp and makes it easy for people to do these operations that I just mentioned. Awesome. That clears a lot up. Thank you very much. <laughs> so kind of getting close to the top of the hour and I have one final question and then a couple of quick fires. Sure. That's all right with you. Sure. Sure. So final one. This might not be an easy one to answer because there's a lot going on, but what, what in the kind of short to medium term are you most excited for in the ecosystem? Oh, um, that's such a hard question. That's kind of like Sophie's <laughs> choice, right? So if I leave anything out, I'm going to get hate mail from all the people that I write about. <laughs> and um, so, uh, you know, you, do you like your son more or daughter more kind of a thing? Um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, let's see. Let's think about things that I'm really excited about. Um, look, I'll tell you one thing. The thing that I'm most excited about, the thing I'm looking forward to is the Avalanche Summit. That's really it. Um, I, I love to see the Avalanche community, such a great set of people. And uh, there's something surprising there every year. There's some cool new things that are coming out every year. And it's such a blast. And that's if I had to name just one thing, I'd name that. Um, it's, it's that community contact that really keeps me going. When I wake up, I'm like, yeah, what happened? Uh, that's, that's sort of what keeps me going. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about all these different spaces. I'm excited about the games coming online. I'm excited about the, the institutional work that's happening. So um, the new, new asset classes that are coming online, very, very exciting work. There are some stable coins coming online that are really exciting also. Uh, Avalanche supports a huge range of FX chains. The world is, is moving to a less stable kind of place, if, if you ask me. And we will see, you know, in the U.S., we're shielded from this. But, uh, but outside, I think there are uh, legitimate reasons for being worried about economic stability. And, uh, and you need a way to buy different kinds of uh, uh, currencies. And so I think the best way to do that right now is on, is on Avalanche. There's a, there's a lot of other things that are happening that are really exciting. And there's, of course, the technical stuff that we're doing behind the scenes to speed up the speed of a single chain, um, to, uh, to, uh, to make it easier for more people to, uh, to run validators. The, we have the Firewood database update coming up. Um, Firewood is already open source. It is a uh, database built for, from the ground up for crypto use. Everybody else uses the same databases to store their data and they're hampered by it. So all these single chain systems, they're limited by the speed of the database they use. 
And so we've built our own separate from what everybody else uses. And it's a heck of a lot faster. So, uh, or it has the potential to be a heck of a lot faster. It isn't quite yet. Um, so the optimizations are still ongoing. And at some point we'll throw the switch and switch the firewood and, and you'll see a huge, huge improvement. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, off the top of my head, uh, there are payments. Oh, I should mention it's payments, international payments. There are some of those systems coming online uh, that I'm really, really excited about. I could go on and on. This is like un unlimited. You know, <laughs> so, Might need a couple more hours. <laughs> exactly. So I don't want to take up all your time and make a laundry list. But, uh, you know, as of this moment, that's what I could remember. If I left anybody out, please don't kill me. Yeah, you were saying people sometimes can't see the wood for the trees with with killer apps and payments. Is yeah, like come on, it, yeah, it's you're clear. seeing what's happening in certain, like certain South American countries at the minute with right. currency devaluation and stuff like that. It's right. you know, it's it's staring everyone in the face. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the enjoyable part now. So quick fire, sure. Strap in, strap in. All, all right. right. So first one. Favorite band or musician of all time? Uh, Bob Dylan. Good answer. Favorite football team, if you have one? Um, Barcelona or Fenerbahce. Now the Turks are going to kill me. Ah. <laughs> 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 okay, we lost. Uh, we lost two thirds of Turkey. <laughs> Barcelona. <laughs> I love and now the Madrid fans are going to kill me too. Anyhow, but that's. <laughs> yeah, they're performing better anyway, so they, they don't have anything to cry about. Um, coffee or tea? Oh, tea. Although I'm drinking coffee today, tea. I'm a tea person. Right. Favorite movie of all time? Um, Dr. Strangelove. Or uh, The Big Lebowski. Dr. Strangelove. Big Lebowski. Is that, uh, is it, what's he doing? White Russian or a black Russian? Yeah, yeah. A white Russian. He drinks white Russians. Yeah. The rug, the, that rug Sorry. really kept the room together. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite holiday destination? Favorite what? holiday destination if you ever get any time off <laughs> i uh i don't know i just go to family <laughs> so <laughs> i fly to family i've been doing that for a couple of years i've had uh, some sick people in my family so i would always go back to family so this last one i think i might <laughs> i think i might have um you know offended luigi and dominic slightly on this last one but it's pineapple on pizza yes or no <laughs> Oh, uh, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm not <laughs> Luigi. Luigi would have been very offended. He is Italian to the core. And uh, yeah, no, no pineapple. No, absolutely. I'm also an Italian citizen, by the way. And uh, no, no, you can't do that. There are rules here <laughs> so, from the big Lebowski. <laughs> and uh, no, I'm really a big believer in, you know, hundreds of years of culture have evolved that set of tastes together. Look, you're triggering a rant here. <laughs> so uh, no, you do not buck the trend. Your ancestors really worked this stuff out. And uh, yeah, no, absolutely not. No pineapple. <laughs> so there you go. Three out of three. So we're not putting pineapple on pizza. But um, Evan, thanks so much. That was that was incredible. Um, really appreciate you taking the time out. And for the people who are listening, I've had a little look at the data of this Delali podcast. There's a lot of people listening consecutively. And 85% of people, if you could believe it, aren't subscribed. That's not good enough. So please just do us a favor and do that. And then you'll see more podcasts like this come up on your feed. But that's enough for me. Evan, thanks so much. And uh, again, open invite whenever you want to come back on. I'm sure there's a million one updates. And um, we'll speak to you next time. Thank you so much for having me, Grant. Very welcome. Very welcome. Take it easy, everyone. Speak to you next time. Bye. All right. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please give us a like, subscribe, and turn the notification bell on for next time. See you.